Thanks, Bridget. Okay, so um, we're a generation that is cursed by longevity. Now, people don't think of longevity as a curse, but if we really think about it, human beings are kind of designed to be around until about the age of 42, at which point we're supposed to be eaten by lions because our joints are aching and we can't get away. So from sort of 42 to 85, what happens is we get all these age-related conditions, and we're not designed for this. We're not supposed to be around. Combined with that, we have all the sort of poor lifestyle choices that we make today. We eat, we eat rubbish, we don't exercise as much as we should, and so we're getting lots of lifestyle-related uh, conditions as well. And so the reality of our generation now is the normal experience of life is ill health. And that's quite a big thought, because actually if you think about our healthcare system, our healthcare system is organized on the idea of dealing with any form of ill health. But if that's the normal experience of life, what does that mean? It can only mean one thing which is that the healthcare system can only grow and grow and grow. And that's what we're seeing all around the world, but the numbers are very dramatic here in the US. Now, why does the healthcare system do that? It does that because the healthcare system is organized on the idea of the biomedical model. It sees everyone as individuals, and it sees a biological deficit that it wants to correct. And that's how it operates. You're an individual, you have a deficit, we're going to throw something at you. That's all it does. And with an aging population, all that can happen is you get more and more and more of that. And that's what we're seeing. You know the numbers. So 18% of this country's GDP is going into healthcare, $2.7 trillion. In, by 2020, one in seven people in this country will be working in the health industry. This is a crazy unsustainable picture that you have. It's not massively different in England or in, in emerging econ economies like China. If you take the US's figures and actually extrapolate to a kind of dystopian future, you end up in a kind of a strange situation whereby the US has an economic interest in its people being sick. Nearly a fifth of your economy is about providing care. You need your people to be sick. It's probably why you don't give many vacations to people, right? It's why, it's why even when you go on vacation, you take your Blackberries with you and keep sending emails, most of which say, I'm sorry I'm on, e I'm on holiday, but I'll answer this when I get back. Why did you answer it while you were on holiday? Um, so we have two massive problems that really conflict with each other. There's, with an aging population, there's more than ever need for care. There's more demand for care than ever before. But yet, at the same time, our only response, which is the healthcare industry, has already grown too large. Those two things are conflicting massively. What do we do about that? I was asking myself that question when I was a physician editor of TEDMED last year. I was looking at 1,600 nominations of some of the biggest ideas in health um, with the idea of putting on a program. So we took that 1,600 and we chose 40, which is a rejection rate of greater than 98%, more choosy than the New England Journal of Medicine. I was still underwhelmed. I was radically underwhelmed. Even though I think we put 40 great talks on last year, I still was underwhelmed with the level of thinking in health, given the size of the problem. And so for the last 18 months, I've been interviewing key opinion leaders, um, and writing a blog and trying to think this stuff through. And in that process, I came across a key fact. And that fact was is that about 10 to 20% of what we call health comes from health care. It's a kind of a big deal. If you think about when we talk about health, we're really talking about health care almost always. And yet we're really playing in the margins. Only 10 to 20% of our health comes from health care. What's the 80%? Well, the 80% comes from... Uh, I'm looking for the, the ATP that comes from genes, behaviors, social factors, and the environment. Now, whenever I list that out, everyone jumps on genes. Oh, genes, yes, personalized medicine, genetic medicine, yes, yes, yes. New toys for the healthcare system to start playing with. Um, expensive toys always as well. But the truth of it is, is the more we've looked at that area of science, is that it's when you have a single mutation in your gene that leads directly to a disease, can we do something effective? When you have multiple mutations or when your genome is responding to the environment, it actually gets way more com complicated. In fact, what we're learning is that the environment is even more important than actually your genome in the case for most conditions. So I take that 80-20 statistic and I, I get quite radical with it. I say healthcare contributes 10 to 20 percent of our health and 80% comes from our communities. That's a really, that when you say it like that, it becomes quite stark. If all we're doing is playing in healthcare, trying to innovate in healthcare over and over again, why the hell aren't we working with our communities? So I've asked myself the question is, how do you create health through community? What does that mean? And that's where my writing, my blogging, and interviewing has been going. So what, why doesn't the health system create health? 
Well, we know why. The health system is designed to respond to people being sick, right? It's not creating health, it's dealing with sickness. The other thing about it is, is that it really works on the individual level. You, it's the biomedical model. You as an individual, you have a biolog biological deficit, let's do something about it. It doesn't think in terms of communities. Now we tell ourselves that public health thinks in terms of communities, and it does to some extent, but what it tends to stop at is correlatory data. It tends to say, we saw these demographics and we're seeing these outcomes. What it doesn't get close enough to is what are the causal pathways between the two. We're kind of stuck behind our spreadsheets. We've seen some nice patterns, we can write some great articles, but we don't really get how this stuff is working. And that's because we're in our offices, we're not in the communities. And I think that is the next step where we have to go. Now, can we get into our communities? You know, quite often, us health professionals are not from the communities we're trying to serve. We're imported in. We don't get these communities. I was just hearing from Regina about Spartanburg, and she was talking about how one of the outlets that sells food doesn't do bacon in the way that the place next to her does. So if you go and get the, what is it you get from over there and the bacon's not right? What was it, Regina? Oh, you were talking about how if you go to one food outlet, the, it's not as good as the food where you are right now. So just from the content of the food, they kind of know where you're from. And that's, that's a, that doesn't show up in a spreadsheet, in an epidemiological study. And yet that's really important to how that community behaves. So the question is, is, what, is what, what is after the biomedical model? If the biomedical model is about individuals with biological deficits and we put health care to them, what else is there? How do you create health through community? Well, people talk about the biosocial model. That's health care plus creating health. What is creating health? Well, the best thing I've read about it has seven modalities. And these modalities are really modalities of well-being. Physical functioning. How often do we talk about whether people function as opposed to whether they're healthy? You can be ill, unwell, but still function. Um, your career. If you have a career, you kind of have a reason for getting out of bed. Your financial situation, your emotional situation, your community, your social and interpersonal interactions, and meaning. Do you have meaning to your life? These are the, this is one of the best things that I've read about what is well-being, what is creating health. Now, people get stuck on meaning because they go, me meaning? How can a health system provide meaning? What are we talking about? Well, there's a great poetry today about the fact that we've got Spartanburg here because I'm sure you all know your Greek mythology. So the Spartans in modern-day Greece had a social system entirely designed around people excelling at, in, in military function. And we all know this because we've all seen the films, right? Uh, we, we've, we, even, we can all probably imagine the costumes. But what was great about that was that social system gave everyone meaning. That community existed for military excellence. So everyone had a role in that community to get, went to a single aim, meaning. Meaning's a big deal. It's not an ephemeral idea. So we know in Glasgow, for instance, where the docks have now closed, the entire workforce has lost its sense of meaning. Glas Glasgow has lost its sense of purpose. And we know that the health outcomes in Glasgow are way worse than the social demographics would suggest. Correlatory data on our spreadsheets doesn't tell us the full story. We have to go into these communities. We see the same story with the Australian Aboriginals. Their identity is so tied to land, the loss of land through imperialism means that these people are seeing way worse outcomes than correlatory data can suggest. There's way more going on here. We have to get out of our offices. I've also seen a nice paper that suggests the same thing's happening to Lithuanian people. It's very difficult stuff, but there's a science here that needs to be unearthed. One of the great things about focusing on well-being is, is that people can be well in the presence of illness. So you can still function and be a productive member of society even if you're ill. Whereas actually the way we work when you only think in terms of healthcare, is you say there's someone who we have to give more services to, make more money off. But actually you can still be a functioning, productive member of society, and that production doesn't always have to be economic. So, so today, from my perspective, what I hope we're doing is beginning to legitimize the science of creating health through community. It's, just not, a, it's not a small aim. It's a very big deal to try to do this. Because I want, in five to ten years from now, I want some health administrator to be asking themselves, all right, we need to improve the, the, the community health. Do we buy an MRI scanner or do we do a community intervention? I want us to get to the point where the evidence in community interventions means that you can actually do a, a comparative effectiveness studies between the two things. Right now, there is so much around whether or not to get an MRI scanner, or as Esther suggested yesterday, build another hospital wing, which is, tends to be what tends, the response tends to be. How do we say, well, no, let's invest in the community, because that will create health, well-being, help people to stay functional.
Now, the good news is, is there's lots of actual great stories out there already. So people are already starting in their own localities. And these are, there's a wonderful term for these people, which I think Rick taught me. This is the idea of positive deviance. People who know the current system's not working, but they're deviating from the current system in order to create something positive. And I think there are enough positive deviants out there who are palpating different elements of something which is the elephant. And I think that what we're part of what we're trying to do right now is to give better visibility of this elephant. And so today's about evaluation, because I think it's only when this is a real science is this going to grow. Um, but I've also been able to corral a bunch of organizations to come to the table, one of which is Hiccup and their Wellville competition. And, but also the Mayo Clinic Center for Innovation, Columbia University's Earth Institute. Seema's here from there today. Hi, Seema. Sir Harry Burns, who's unfortunately not been able to make it today. The Institute for a Sustainable Future, they're not here. FSG are here. Hi, Marcy. Um, Guys and St. Thomas's Charity, who recently given me a grant, they're not here today. University of Toronto, the Alliance of Community Health Plans, is Lynn here yet? Hi Lynn, hello. I was wondering what you look like. Um, and I also have been very lucky to be uh, advised by uh, 10 really smart people, one of whom has been Lee, and Scott, who's here as well. Where's Scott? So in the last, for my last 18 months as I've been writing and blogging, I've had 10 really smart people advising me as I've been going, and I'm lucky enough to have two of them in the room today. I just want to end with a quote from an author that Lee's actually been getting me to read, and I've been reading over the last month or so. His name's Wendell Berry. Um, he's an observer and critic of neighborliness, stewardship, true security, and true patriotism. Only an American would describe himself as sort of being a true patriot. Most of us kind of hate our own countries, but you guys kind of, you know, fly your flag crazy. He's actually a farmer. He's actually a farmer, but he sees his work within that lens. And I, and I, I have to say that I sort of started reading this going, isn't this kind of foodie nonsense? You know, I'm a Londoner, so I buy whatever burger I can get on the way home from work. Um, but actually, I thought the book was incredible, and I've amalgamated a bunch of, um, of his essays into a, single, uh, into a single quote, which I hope he won't mind. We need to find better ways to understand and to talk about the worth of such supposedly unquantifiable values as community stability and community health. The industrial solution, so healthcare solution for such things, is to increase the scale of work, build another hospital wing, to increase the scale of work and to, to bring big ideas, big money, big technology into communities. The bought-in industry and experts invariably alien to the places to which they are brought into. The deciders of solutions for communities should have to live with the results of their decisions. Only an appropriately scaled, locally adapted, locally owned solution can make use of a natural resource such as a community. I found that book stunning, and I, and I do recommend his writing. And so I just want to end with a really simple sentence, which is that I believe that communities have the answers. And I think it's our job to build a science around them to give them a voice. Thank you.